Hello. Hello. Yes, you. Yes, could you hear me, guys? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, Srinam. Yes, I thought I just finished my introduction. Could you start? Okay, sounds good, Srinam. Sorry, I didn't hear the introduction. So, should we start? Uh, let me just recap, maybe. Uh, hello and welcome, everybody. My name is Sridam. I am from the Nudge Foundation. It's a pleasure to introduce our panelists today, uh, Kartik Desai and Aparna Dua from Asha Impact. They're here with us to present a masterclass on blended financial instruments. The floor is yours, Karthik. Great. Thank you, Shiram. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and thank you for the Nudge Foundation for hosting this incredible event, uh, bringing together so many different practitioners from the development industry. So uh, Asha Impact is pleased to be you know, uh, presenting this track on blended finance. We have a series of interesting discussions lined up over the next few days. Uh, starting with a panel discussion uh, uh, amongst the three funders, a capacity uh, development discussion with experts talking about how NGOs can best be prepared to uh, raise blended finance, and uh, uh, a high-level discussion with Vikram Gandhi and Shantanu Ghosh. So before we did all of that, we thought we would at least like to demystify to some extent what blended finance means. So we have a small presentation here, which uh, me and my colleague Aparna will take you through. Uh, Aparna, please, can we go to the next slide? Uh, just a very, very quick introduction to Asha Impact, uh, not to take more than two minutes on this. We are basically a combination of an impact investment platform and a policy advocacy platform. Uh, the unique thing about us is that we do uh, this for a network of Indian business leaders. So it's exclusively domestic capital from the sort of individuals that you see mentioned there. So that's basically the Asha Trust model. And our theory of change, uh, or as I said, the reason we do this is uh, because we're trying to basically achieve two things. One is uh, we are focused, at least on the impact investment side, on market-based solutions, right? So solutions which can scale with commercial capital, which may need impact investment to initially seed the innovation to de-risk the early stage model. But really the objective to create scale is to try and attract some extent of commercial capital. So that's what we've tended to do in our impact investments. And we've done this across sectors that you see there below. So we're one of those sector agnostic investors. But unlike the classic impact investors, like I said, we also have this not-for-profit, uh, this uh, think tank, uh, the Asha Impact Trust, which has been trying to really build the overall market for impact investment, working on policy advocacy in specific social sectors with the government, with state governments and national governments, and probably most critically, trying to enable blended, blended finance. So what really is blended finance? Uh, let, us, let us get into that. Uh, so the classic uh, you know, blended finance tool is what is usually known as an impact bond. Uh, before we jump into the slide, I just want to step back for a second and just mention that, look, blended finance, what it essentially, it means different things to different people, right? Some people call it pay for success. Some people call it results-based financing, RBF, right? So the, this is a conceptual way of talking about finance, uh, which is you have philanthropic capital, which is non-return seeking capital, and you've got commercial capital. When you bring the two of them together, that's basically blended finance. So it's how do you bring together capital creatively? Philanthropic capital, debt capital, or equity capital, okay? So social impact bonds or development impact bonds are an example of this, of what, of, uh, you know, of, of a financial instrument uh, to achieve this outcome. So this uh, slide tries to sort of explain what, it, what a social impact bond, development impact bond is. I'll try to explain it to you as simply as possible. Essentially, a development impact bond is a way of financing social service delivery. So think about currently, if the government does this, uh, let's say they have to build a hospital or they have to build a school, there's a certain outlay and a certain outcomes associated with that. Now imagine instead of the government doing it, you have a private party doing that, an NGO or a for-profit social, uh, social enterprise. That's what's known as a service provider. So the service provider carries out a certain intervention. That intervention is funded by risk capital, right? which is the initial capital that it costs to provide that intervention. Whatever is the outcome or the outputs of that intervention are independently measured by the outcome funders or, or rather by the independent evaluators who share that information with the outcome funders. And if the service provider has been successful in delivering uh, the outcomes that have been targeted, then the outcome funders pay back the risk capital. Sounds very co complex, but essentially it's a way of, you know, 
deferring the payment for outcomes on the part of the outcome funder, right? Uh, for the for, for the for the risk capital, it's it's entirely brand new. So you're essentially creating a new class of philanthropists because earlier you just had the philanthropist giving money to the service provider. So think of an impact bond as essentially a way for the outcome funder to leverage his or her capital, right? By crowding in all this additional capital from risk capital, and also this risk capital, these investors are focused not just on giving their money, but because that money is at risk doing the due diligence and the performance management to ensuring that the likelihood of the intervention is, uh, is, is, is high. So this is a little bit about, you know, what impact bonds are. We wanted to make sure that, you know, folks understood this. Um, just moving ahead, uh, Aparna, in terms of the global impact bond market and the, in the market in India, there's a lot of research uh, which has come out on this over the last uh, few years, right? Uh, with the increasing attention on this space. So this is the, uh, we've sort of tried to summarize all of that. So, 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 so what do we see here? In total, there've been about 185 impact bonds that have been launched, okay? But the vast majority, all except maybe, uh, I think 17 or 18, have been in developed countries. So that's the first important thing to keep in mind, that this was really something that was pioneered in the United Kingdom and has been implemented in the United States, in Australia. And only in the last couple of years, you've started to see this happening in developing countries. And of course, there's fundamental differences there. For example, look at the average beneficiaries. In a developed country, it's about 12,000, which is not that high. Uh, the average size of a bond has been about 3 million. And because it often takes time and cost to set up these bonds, that has been one of the uh, criticisms of, of, of bonds that say in developed markets, that it has sometimes been more expensive uh, relative to the number of people who are reached. But of course, when we talk about doing impact bonds in developing countries, that changes considerably. The costs go down and the outreach go up. So if you just go to the next slide, um, you'll see that, that in the developing world, what is the situation with impact bonds? So as we said, there's about 17 total bonds. Uh, uh, SIDS are of course where the government is the sponsor, that's a social impact bond, and a development impact bond means where a philanthropist replaces the government. You can see that India technically has the most, uh, three bonds, which are active bonds, which are in the market, which have been closed. This does not include more than I would say up to a dozen or so bonds, which are currently in various stages of development, which is the most that we've seen uh, in any country. So India really is at an inflection point now, and we're seeing a lot more of these things happening. And of course, what we're gonna talk about is the relevance of, of development impact bonds, specifically in the post COVID world. Uh, you know, once, once we have sort of covered some of these basic building blocks. And just in case folks aren't aware, uh, you have the three bonds which are currently in the market, just to quickly recap. The first one is a single provider, uh, DIB, which is in education, which is in Rajasthan with an NGO called Educate Girls. This bond has already closed and it has uh, you know, been very successful. And it's specifically focused on an NGO in Rajasthan, which is working to bring out of school girls into school and improving their learning outcomes in the school. Utkrisht uh, and the Quality Education DIB are both multi-provider dips. In other words, you've got, in the case of Utkrisht, four or five healthcare service providers, and in the uh, case of the quality education bond, three or four uh, education providers. You've got risk capital, which has been mobilized by folks, uh, principally by UBS Optimist Foundation, uh, and Dhan is you know, gonna be joining us for the panel. So H&Is have funded these interventions uh, according to agreed outcomes. And as and when, and each year, these NGOs meet their targets uh, they get funding for the next year. And if they're unsuccessful, then, uh, you know, then, then, then that intervention is discontinued. And broadly, you can see in terms of the areas where these bonds have been most active, this is across emerging markets. Uh, you've seen five or so in healthcare, five or so in employment, and three of them in education. So this is broadly in terms of the market overview. And, and, uh, and finally, and then I'll hand it over to, you know, to, to Aparna, uh, why do we use development impact bonds? There's basically you know, four reasons. Number one, impact bonds drive efficiency and efficacy in the, in the spending of precious philanthropic dollars, right? Because they essentially allow uh, philanthropists to only pay in the event of success and to crowd in additional capital. And also to sort of you know, build the larger development ecosystem and create the right incentives for, for the, uh, all the various parties and measure that this intervention is being done 
more cost effectively than the alternative. So that is the principal reason why you know, philanthropists are interested in this. The second reason is that it crowds in and brings in new types of philanthropists, which we're calling risk investors. Risk investors are the folks who give the upfront money where they get some return paid out by the outcome funder philanthropists. So for them, think about it this way, like impact, a classic impact investor, like Asha Impact or any impact fund, it's an opportunity to create much deeper impact than classic impact investing, albeit at more moderate returns. Uh, and you get to recycle that capital, which is something very, very interesting for many philanthropists. So that's the second reason. Thirdly, for the NGO, it allows the NGO to be a lot more efficient and flexible. The NGO or the, source, the social service provider is basically told that these are, these are the outcomes you have to deliver. And as long as you deliver them, you'll get paid. And you can tweak and adjust your approach and your methodology along the way. And it gives you that flexibility. And of course, at the end of it, you get to track what is working and what's not working which is useful not just for that NGO, but for the larger development ecosystem and figuring out uh, you know, what, what interventions work, what don't, quantifying how much they work, and even being able to price that, that for being able to deliver this many units of impact, this is how much uh, financial incentive that should be equivalent to. So this is some of the important reasons why impact bonds we feel are very, very important and why we've seen them scaling up uh, substantially. Great. Thanks, Karthik. And um, I think maybe where I'll pick up from is just to kind of emphasize, you know, because um, given today's webinar, we're talking about how can we all really come together, uh, you know, pool resources um, to really, uh, you know, a, drive an action plan for COVID and also kind of, you know, chart that post-COVID world together. So I think the point on um, having complete flexibility on program delivery is an important one. And we'll also kind of be discussing that in more detail with a couple of experts tomorrow morning at 11. So please do, you know, join in for that as well. But um, really, I think to take, take the discussion forward from where, uh, you know, Karthik left off. Now, we do have about 180 odd bonds, uh, you know, globally, as he mentioned. And, um, you know, there is evidence supporting, you know, some of the arguments and there's um, sort of lack of evidence, you know, on a couple of other things. So quickly, you know, what are those key points? I think as Kartik mentioned, it's driving, um, you know, a lot of collaboration between different parties, whether that's investors, whether that's, um, you know, consulting companies that act as program managers, the service providers themselves and government, so since you're always sort of working, you know, with um, government as, as a provider. So there is evidence that it's supporting collaboration, it's bringing about a deeper focus on outcomes, which is very, very different from how uh, some of the interventions have been focused in the past, you know, more sort of input driven or activity driven. This really sort of squarely brings the attention of all parties involved onto achieving those outcomes. Uh, again, tying into that, previous point that we were making about offering complete flexibility to service providers, right? So everyone's working to achieve, say, an increase in learning outcomes and the pathways to getting there may be different. Uh, you're deploying strong program management uh, as well so that you're constantly getting feedback on how you're doing on the ground, whether the intervention is working or not. Uh, and in that sense, sort of building a culture of monitoring and evaluation, um, so those are where, you know, there is sufficient evidence when we look at, uh, you know, impact bonds globally. Now, some of the other claims that have been made for impact bonds that you would have heard are, uh, you know, it's supporting experimental interventions or it's crowding in a lot of private funding. Now, while that may not really be the case um, globally, um, or there isn't enough evidence to support it rather. In India, at least we're seeing some, you know, promising signs of that, which is great. Um, you know, specifically, if one were to look at the example of Waterfield Advisors, they've been able to mobilize domestic capital for an agri dip, uh, uh, for the dip in agriculture, which is meant to hit the market in a, in a couple of months. And similarly, as you know, Karthik mentioned earlier in the West, um, you know, we've only had beneficiaries, you know, in, in a couple of thousand. But in India, both, um, you know, the healthcare dip as well as the quality education India dip um, have, you know, two lakh and six lakh beneficiaries. So there's, um, you know, there's clearly good and strong evidence coming from India. And there is that, that focus on scale, which is great. Um, you know, just looking at what data is available on the success rate of impact bonds as well. So uh, we only have, uh, you know, data for about 47 uh, of, the, of the 185 bonds that are out there. Um, and of that, it's, it's pretty promising because, you know, 50% uh, of those have returned positive uh, returns, which is great. 
And uh, you know, as and when more data comes in, uh, we hope that you know, using this evidence base, we can continue to grow the space of impact bonds and blended finance overall as well. And then lastly, I don't think a discussion on impact bonds would be um, you know, complete without actually discussing what are really the challenges. We've talked about how the market is at an inflection point. But um, I think it's worth sort of spending a couple of minutes talking about what are the challenges to scaling up as well, right? I mean, if you look at a decade of impact bonds globally, we, we only have about 400 odd million that's been um, catalyzed or mobilized in terms of capital. So why is that really the case, right? So we've seen a um, couple of challenges. One is with the, the funding itself, right? Whether it's on the outcome funding side or on the risk capital side. Now, the, for the risk capital, I mean, investors don't really see um, the return uh, on an adjusted, on a risk adjusted basis. They don't really see the returns necessarily as being attractive. So, so far, impact bonds, um, you know, we've only seen participation from uh, impact focused uh, investors. So h and family offices that do want to allocate a part of their portfolio towards impact. We've seen participation from them. Um, you know, similarly on, on metrics, and these are some of the topics that we'll go deeper into in the following chat from five to six, there isn't um, standardization of metrics, which, you know, drives up costs and often, uh, you know, leads to elongated discussions between the risk capital and the outcome funder uh, as to what is really the right price um, for a particular outcome. So given that we don't have enough standardized metrics, so this is something that can often take time. And then lastly, given the nascency of um, you know, the field itself, we've seen that these instruments in the past have taken about two to three years to structure. But again, uh, there is you know, strong evidence coming in that by templatization of some of these documents, we can actually drive down uh, the time taken to, to structure some of these bonds and also bring down the costs effectively. So those are really the challenges. And I think as and when the field grows, we will continue to see some of these being addressed and they are already um, you know, early signs of that happening. Um, with that, just to you know, conclude, um, just giving you a brief sense of where the market is. Um, you know, India, as Karthik said, has the most number of impact bonds uh, amongst the developing nations. And we can see we have a fairly robust um, market with um, you know, tons of outcome funders, risk investors, even though challenges persist, but we're seeing a fairly robust market. And of course, this is um, only meant to be illustrated because the service providers would vary uh, from, a, from any particular sector. So we'll uh, maybe open it up to a couple of uh, questions. I see a lot have poured in. Unfortunately, we may not be able to get to all, but if we can use the next maybe five, six minutes uh, to take a couple of questions. Maybe we can do that. I think I do. Uh, I've been looking at the questions and thank you very much uh, for all of them. Uh, unfortunately, we've only blocked half an hour here. So we'll only be able to cover a couple of questions. But we do have a one hour session after this uh, with, like I said, the three probably leading organizations in this space, you know, uh, which is UBS, Optimus, Michael and Susan Dell Foundation and the British Asia Trust. And that is a one hour session. So please, uh, come there and we can continue to answer your questions there. Uh, and some people have asked for the presentation, so certainly we'll be happy to share that also. But uh, since we do have a few moments, I think, look, two, two important questions, you know, sets of questions have been raised. A lot of people are asking, who are impact bonds relevant for? What type of NGOs? Can an NGO raise it just to cover its operating costs? Can impact bonds be raised by social enterprises? So let's answer that. And some, a lot of people have been asking, other than impact bonds, what are the other blended finance instruments? That, that's an important question as well. So on the first question, look, it, and different people will have different perspectives on this, but an impact bond is really a scaling instrument. It's not a grant. It's not, a, you know, it's, not, it's not to cover the operating cost of trying a new intervention. But if you have an intervention which is working, and on a relative basis, you're able to provide a better outcome for a lower cost right, than the government, then that intervention deserves to be scaled, right? Let's say you're currently running uh, an educational intervention in a certain geography for, let's say, 1,000 people, and it's going really well. Ultimately, how do you scale that to, let's say, 10,000 people? Uh, so impact bonds are best suited for, uh, you know, for, for scaling. There's no reason why a social enterprise technically can't also participate in this, though, you know, because impact bonds are philanthropic, 
they are generally focused on NGOs, but a social enterprise could also raise that grant through a, a service contract. But it kind of links to that second question of what are other blended finance instruments other than impact bonds? Uh, and, and, and the principal category there is what are called social success notes or guarantee structures, okay, SSNs. And those are basically things having to do with uh, structured debt or subsidizing debt in some way. And that is most relevant to social enterprises. So think about, I'll give you a couple of quick examples uh, you know, of, of structured debt. Imagine you have a social service provider that is doing healthcare skilling for, uh, you know, for workers to train them for healthcare delivery, or you've got a, you know, a, a, a service provider that's giving income support to migrant workers who are affected by COVID who don't have incomes. So you can give them a loan, right, at a, at a low interest rate. So there the risk capital would come in and provide a loan for someone to take a skilling course or for someone to have income in their pocket until the lockdown ends and they're back in their jobs. And they pay a subsidized interest rate on that loan, anywhere from 0%, it can be a zero cost loan, to 8, 9, 10%, but much lower than the market rate that they would be charged. So the risk capital is charging that loan, right? Now, certain portion of those, of those loans will default because those people won't be able to pay back. And the outcome funder covers that, that, that default, you know, with a, with a risk guarantee. So that's another example of, uh, you know, of, of, of a blended finance structure, which is not a classical impact bond. Uh, and as you can see, that can be relevant to a for-profit or not-for-profit. So hopefully, I know that was a bit brief, but at least it gives you an example of the fact that there are many, many structures out there beyond impact bonds. And the, the, there's a tremendous relevance that many of these structures actually have uh, in the post-COVID scenario, uh, in healthcare and in education and skilling and service delivery. So in the next session that we have, which is starting exactly in five minutes, uh, we'll actually be diving into that in detail. I'll just um, add to that, uh, you know, typically in a social success note, uh, you're basically, uh, you know, again, since we promised this to, to make this completely jargon free, uh, as long as an enterprise can, uh, you know, pay their loan or service their debt, um, they should be, you know, looking at an instrument like a social success note where the outcome funder is really, uh, you know, providing an, a, a subvention to the loan, right? So they're minimizing the interest or minimizing the principal that the social enterprise has to pay back. Um, and typically, impact bonds would be better suited for a nonprofit that doesn't have a sustainable revenue model and are completely sort of dependent on grants. Um, there was another question about uh, how do you make impact bonds uh, suited for programs that may have uh, outcomes that are realized over a long time, maybe a decade. So I think that that's a great question. So, you know, one of the key things that one has to, uh, to keep in mind when you're designing an impact bond is really are, what are the outcomes that one is going after. They have to be uh, measurable, they have to be quantifiable. And if one feels that those outcomes will only get achieved over a decade, then one has to work collaboratively with the funders, with the service provider, to define intermediary, uh, intermediate outcomes that can be measured, say, over two years or three years. So, for example, in Rajasthan, the theory of change is that an accredited uh, private hospital will actually lead to better healthcare outcomes for mothers and their newborn babies. So instead of actually measuring uh, you know, birth rate or death rate, they're actually measuring accreditation um, and improved, um, uh, sort of improved accreditation for these hospitals. So you can set intermediate outputs as long as all parties involved agree and it feeds into your uh, larger theory of change, which is backed by evidence. Well done. Um, I think we've um, bucketed some of these questions that would have answered. Um, uh, Kartik, are there any other questions that um, we need to answer? Or I think we should move on to the next panel, perhaps. I think we have one more minute. If uh, Irwan asked a good question, which is, why are, the education, why are the devs focused so much on education? And we'll talk in much more detail about education in the next panel, but uh, other areas where devs could be relevant. Sure. Um, so thanks for that question. So yes, globally, you know, we've seen, um, as we showed in this slide as well, dibs have uh, happened, you know, in employment and social welfare, healthcare. Again, it, it comes down to the outcome funder who's really the commissioner of the outcomes to drive this forward, um, as well as the outcomes need to be measurable, quantifiable. However, having said that, like I mentioned, we are starting to see dibs in agriculture, um, water, sanitation, so different sectors are, uh, you know, opening up to this as well. Okay.
Okay, thank you so much, Karthik uh, uh, and Aparna, for that sort of, for those insights. I'm sure we learn a lot about you know devs and other blended financial instruments over the course of the next couple of days as well. Uh, we're going to take a, a short break right now for a minute or two before we begin the next session. I request the participants to stay in the same room as you are in right now. And uh, we're going to be having Prachi, Dhan, Davar, uh, and Abha from three leading organizations who have significant experience in development impact bonds. Thanks, Sriram, and um, you know, thank you all for who joined in today and for all the questions that you asked. So, Asha Impact has uh, you know co-created co the fundraising and philanthropy track, and are driving all the series on the blended finance discussion, including um, the one right after. So, would encourage all of you if you found this discussion interesting, if you've always had question on what these instruments are, are these right for me? Uh, do listen in uh, right after this. We have the investors, as Sri Ram mentioned, and then um, over the course of next two days, we have discussions with experts on capacity building, whether a DIB is actually suitable for your organization or not, um, as well as a fireside chat with Vikram Gandhi, who is um, the co-founder of Asha Impact, as well as um, a professor at HBS, who will be discussing the role of philanthropy and blended finance as we uh, all pull together to recreate the world post-COVID. Thank you for dialing in today. Thank you all very much. It was a pleasure. Sure. Let us know when yeah. we can. Yeah, so let's start. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for waiting uh, in this room. We'll move on to the next session on an investor roundtable on, on sort of leveraging blended finance, specifically in education and skilling, and perhaps even beyond that. Uh, we do have a couple of new participants. We will have one more participant from British Asian Trust joining us shortly, uh, but we should get started. And Karthik, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. and uh, once again, thank you to the Nudge Foundation for facilitating this uh, session, and thank you to our three panelists. Uh, welcome, Prachi, welcome, Dan, and Abha will be joining us shortly. Uh, so I'll just uh, jump right in and you know, set, set the context. Uh, we've spoken a little bit about uh, what blended finance is, but uh, what we really wanted to say was that, why is blended finance important? You know, this is really an, uh, a tool and in an industry which is at an inflection point 
in terms of its increasing adoption, both by NGOs and funders and philanthropists. As we saw, there's 185 of these instruments globally, 17 in emerging markets, three in India, but most importantly, more than a dozen under development. Uh, so there's definitely this incredible potential to scale up and address uh, you know, development challenges and, and uh, potentially specific challenges you know, raised by, uh, by COVID, by the lockdown, and by all of the implications of uh, you know, what this new normal has created. So what we were wanting to do in this session is to focus with uh, you know, uh, these three individuals and organizations who are the, the leaders and the pioneers in really having brought the sector this far, uh, and specifically look at the area of education and skilling. Which is, a, which is a major, you know, sort of uh, 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 critically important development area. And again, post-COVID becomes supremely important, right? You've seen students being out of school. So there's this uh, whole notion of having to study from home. Uh, lower income students uh, necessarily would be more disadvantaged in that sort of a scenario. How do you even go back to school? Learning outcomes are falling behind. So there's a lot of issues in education uh, and a lot of opportunities potentially. And then of course in skilling, uh, already we've seen massive amounts of job losses across segments. Of course in the blue collar segments, but also in the white collar segment. Uh, skilling has always been a, a, a challenging thing, uh, you know, to, to appropriately identify, train, place, and retain someone in a meaningful job, which, is, uh, which pays them well, uh, which, which gives them a dignity of life, and where they actually, uh, which they actually aspire to. So in these two critical sectors, we would like to understand, uh, you know, what are the major lessons from blended finance uh, and where is the market likely to go? Uh, you know, so I wanted to just uh, potentially frame four large challenges which the sector faces. And then I'll introduce each of the speakers and I would request each of them, you know, to share both what their organization has been doing, uh, the insights from their experiences working on dips. Uh, and their views on, you know, uh, how best blended finance can play a role going forward using specific examples. So those four sort of key issues are, you know, one is obviously unlocking outcome funding and risk capital. How do we get more investors uh, aboard? Second is obviously around metrics, right? And uh, how do you metricize price outcomes and standardize things? Uh, the third issue is around the lowering of transaction costs and building the depth in the market. How do we create more and more impact bonds. And of course, we've not spoken about this too much so far, but get, the fourth issue is around getting the buy-in from the government and really trying to see how you can unlock you know, more capital to make it CSR ready. Uh, so with each of these uh, folks, we'll focus on something uh, slightly different. Uh, first, let me just go through and quickly do a round of introductions. Uh, so our first panelist uh, will be Prachi. Uh, Prachi is the director uh, at the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation in India which has dedicated itself as a foundation to focusing on the uh, issue of transforming the lives of children, specifically children in urban poverty through better education and economic stability. They're currently working with, I think, over 12 million beneficiaries, and Prachi is on the board of many of their main investees and advisory committees to the state governments and education departments. Uh, previously, she has worked at the Boston Consulting Group and also in the telecom sector in the US, uh, and she's an alumni of IIT Delhi, and uh, uh, UCLA and University of Chicago. So welcome, uh, Prachi. Uh, secondly, we'll hear from uh, Dhan. Uh, Dhan is the head of social finance and the India head at the UBS Optimus Foundation, uh, which is probably the most uh, largest and most important risk investor in not just ed this education, but most of the dibs so far. Uh, Dhan has had a background in programs and in fact uh, management uh, before UBS. You used to work with Hand in Hand, Switzerland, uh, where she was a chief operating officer. Uh, and before this, she was a CEO of a fantastic NGO uh, uh, that many of you may be familiar with called Apnale, which focuses on healthcare and education in Mumbai and is doing fantastic work right now, uh, as we've seen uh, in the COVID situation. Uh, and she's also worked at Give India, GuideStar, and is a veteran uh, you know, of this uh, development sector. So, so uh, welcome, Dan. Great to have you here. Uh, and our third speaker is going to be Abha, who will be short, shortly joining us. She's just in a previous session. Abha is the executive director of the British Asian Trust. Uh, she has uh, been a founding member of the British Asian Trust, uh, which has launched this 11 million quality education in India DIB, where the Dell Foundation and UBS have also been involved. Uh, and she's also a fellow at the Government Outcomes Lab 
at the, at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford and has, and, and has been a thought leader in how different approaches to finance and grant making can be applied uh, in development finance. So with a quick introduction to our speakers, I will now sort of hand it over to each of them, uh, starting first with Prachi. Uh, so Prachi, uh, what uh, we'd love for you to sort of talk mm -hmm. about what Dell Foundation has done, the fantastic experience that you guys have here with a focus on basically two issues. One, given all of your experience in education, what are the models which are the most relevant in your, in your opinion? And if you can talk about the different financial structures that you have been involved in, uh, which, you know, including Vartana, the multi-provider DIV, uh, the impact-linked debt, and other plans that you have. So over to you, Prachi. Thank you very much. Thanks, Karthik. Thanks, Aparna, for setting it up so well. And I think in that masterclass and the setup that you've done, uh, you've answered one of the question that what will it take for more such instruments to happen, uh, widespread education and, uh, and you know, more and more of us understanding uh, not just the nuances of them, but also the simplicity of them uh, is, uh, is, you know, is what really is needed. And uh, Asha Impact is doing an outstanding job in terms of, uh, in terms of making that more mainstream. So coming to the foundation, we've done several of these um, performance-linked financing programs, as I would call them. And we started with uh, two objectives. The first objective is for us to do performance-linked financing uh, as an option is to scale impact. You know, can you know, something which is proven, which is giving the outcomes and the results, can we actually scale it? So that's the, uh, that's the objective number one. And the second objective is how can we actually crowd in more funding? How can we be more collaborative in the sectors and uh, specific subsectors in which we are working? And when I say collaborative, I mean um, much more than just crowding in funding. A large part of the collaboration is also standardizing those metrics and also getting a larger pool of uh, outcome of funders agreeing on the same set of metrics and working towards a common uh, towards a common outcome so those have been our two primary objectives for engaging in these uh, it's a fast growing area of work for us over the last 3 years we have structured now more than um, for five such instruments. Uh, some we've done much more as pilots and you know, the others uh, we've been able to scale uh, in collaboration with uh, other partners and two of them are here today. Um, so you know, thanks Aparna. We have uh, uh, experimented with several pay for performance funding mechanisms. A few of them I will quickly share some outcomes and results on. You know, the ones I've shown on the slide are all in the area of education. And, uh, and we tried, you know, a three-pronged strategy over there. We had a certain set of interventions, which is row number one and row number two over here, uh, where we wanted to improve learning outcomes in budget private schools. These are low-cost private schools across India. And uh, while these schools are... Um, our paid schools, poor people are uh, sending, are paying fees to be on these uh, in these schools. Their outcomes have typically not been very high, and so we did two pilots, performance link pilots over here, where we uh, where we gave incentives to schools to see if with those financial incentives, the outcomes uh, of children studying in these schools can improve. So those are two that we did much more as pilots, and I'll show the results of one of them. Um, the other one is the other big area of work and someone in the master class was asking about how social enterprises and NGOs can participate in it. It was very much structured around how can they actually scale uh, impact and you know uh, scale organizations which have deep impact in education. So this uh, the quality education India, the development impact bond which we are partnering with UBS and British Asian Trust for is much more an intervention in that direction where we've taken a certain set of proven interventions, put them in a development impact bond structure and you know are scaling them in several schools. And the objective in all of them, like we said, you know, I'm right now talking only about the education sector has been to improve learning outcomes of students. If you can go to the next slide, Aparna. Very quickly now sharing the structure of one of them, which is the performance link financing for affordable private schools that I was talking about. 
here in the you know the the model that we've put together is that we have come in with debt funding for school financing company vartana is one such school financing company which provides debt to low fee schools typically the schools use this debt to um, improve infrastructure of these schools and we wanted to shift that towards deploying towards improvement of quality in schools so this is the objective with which the debt has been given to vartana and the performance linked structuring part of it vartana gives that debt to schools with a program on top that if the schools improve their learning outcomes then the interest rate is reduced for the schools which are improving the learning outcomes and that reduction is subsidized by us in the interest rate in which we have given the loan to vartana so this is you know we are working on both sides of this uh, dip if you were to call it both on the risk as well as the outcome side of it and throughout the process we have um, an independent evaluator who will come and do baseline midline assessments for the schools to ensure that the learning outcomes have in fact improved so these are um, if you move to the next slide please so these are uh, you know very quick results on on what we found we found uh, that you know the achievements is actually outstanding we um, we found that we ran this in two cohorts of uh, 130 schools approximately each and we found that approximately 74% three fourth of the schools actually achieved the target which is huge and how these targets have been defined is that we got the independent evaluator to come and assess that how much do kids usually learn through a school year and the targets are over and above that so it it's uh, it's it's an it's an outcome which is over and above what they would have achieved so over over a period of 2 years we found that you know schools have achieved as much as 25 points so uh, improvement on their baseline which is which is what we are learning across different instruments that we are finding that not only a large number uh, that these incentives work and a large number of um, service providers are actually meeting the targets but what we are also finding and abha and uh, dhan will talk a bit more about it that it actually deepens the impact you know we are get we are getting higher outcomes than what we've seen in a non incentive linked structure and which is hugely exciting for us as uh, as outcome funders so this is one example where we could structure our debt very much linked to uh, how uh, to outcomes and improving outcomes at scale the second structure as described in the next slide is um, is a much more uh, complex one but nevertheless a fun one when you have good partners uh, so this is uh, this has this is this is a very typical dib structure it is a development impact bond where michael and susan dell foundation is the outcome funder ubs is the risk investor we've commonly selected a set of service providers which are very well known ngos in india had a very good proven track record of uh, improving learning outcomes of students this is now being measured by cre matters india and uh, you know based on them achieving these targets and as we are finding over achieving these targets payments are made and uh, risk investor gets both its principal as well as its uh, an interest rate on top of that principal um we have also used similar instruments if i not you could move to the next slide uh we have also used this concept of impact linked debt to achieve broader objectives for example we gave a debt to a, com a skilling com skilling financing company called edufan eduvans which provides a uh, loans to students for uh, uh, for doing skilling courses but you know before we came in the the kind of students who were coming there were from slightly more uh you know they were not from the target segment that we truly care, uh, we are trying to impact which is uh, families of less than 25000 rupees monthly household income the the loans were much more for higher end uh, uh, programs and you know slightly more affluent students so we gave them a very specific debt facility through where we said that you know the, this debt facility at a at a standard uh, interest rate which is a lower interest rate than what they can get in the market can be deployed and through that we've tried to get 
uh, you know, them to extend their product in a segment which is riskier because of the higher risk of NPAs in that segment. But, you know, we are taking that risk, absorbing that risk for them and creating another model, which hopefully, you know, both of these are the Vartana and Advance are very much like pilots to prove the point that, you know, these instruments can work. And um, so far, actually, they have not only been able to deploy the entire facility, uh, the, the debt facility that was given to them for students coming from uh, low income families, but actually have very low NPA on, uh, on, on these loans. So, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, these two pilots, three pilots, uh, DIB is no longer a pilot. Just to quickly show that, you know, this is no longer a very esoteric concept. This can be done. It is more complex to structure, but at the same time, the outcomes that can be achieved are, are higher, not just the same are higher. And, you know, Creates, uh, creates a discipline and creates a scale, which is probably not achievable through direct financing. Um, maybe I can just quickly flip the next slide through Aparna and move to my final slide, uh, which is that, you know, where are we going from there, as Karthik asked. So we are looking upon these as, uh, you know, as instruments through which we can impact not just the education sector, but many other sectors. So the DIB, like I said, is achieving outcomes and is achieving deeper outcomes than what we were getting in a non-DIB structure. So we definitely want to scale instruments like that and hopefully scale them now in partnership with the government and have social impact bonds. Um, Vartana and ISFC, the school financing companies that pilots that we've done, they were much more pilots where we were the only funder. And these now we are looking at uh, putting through larger fund-like structures. Kaizen is one of the partners and they're speaking tomorrow through the conference. Uh, who is looking at extending similar pilots and similar instruments to a much larger set of financial intermediaries. And we are also looking at exploring such pay for performance models for other sectors like skilling and jobs. And uh, as we talk, there is, a, there is an advanced conversation which is going on with the National Skill Development Con Cor uh, Corporation to put together such an instrument. So there is a lot of scope in where we can take it from here. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Prachi. You know, it's, it's just fantastic to, to, to see the range of uh, what you guys have worked on. And, uh, you know, the classic dip, obviously, you know, is, is, is something that uh, is very interesting, but equally interesting is the impact linked debt. And, then, and the fact that, you know, this can be applied, as your examples show, either to the intermediary, which is what Vartana is. Vartana is an NBFC that lends to the schools so they can build infrastructure, or it can be lent to the individual end user, as you guys are doing. Yeah which exactly. is a student or the family uh, that needs to pay for the education. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and look, and we see education and skilling as sort of part of a curriculum. So it makes a lot of sense that uh, uh, as part of the spectrum. So it makes a lot of sense to, to be looking at skilling going forward. Uh, could you just share a thought, Prachi? I mean, sorry to ask you this, put you on the spot, but specifically to COVID, you know, and the challenge of education and skilling, uh, the, the, the relevance of blended finance. Uh, Huge, huge, uh, Karthik, because, you know, what the advantage, uh, and I see Abha smiling over there because she's, uh, she'll probably, you know, talk a little bit more about uh, what they are thinking of in structuring some of these instruments in the wake of COVID. But, you know, the relevance has increased even more because, you know, you are... You, you want to now in the face of the pandemic, in the face of a crisis, really maximize the efficacy of every single philanthropic dollar which is going out there. So there has been interest from the government in these, uh, you know, and can we roll them out sooner? There has been interest from more and more philanthropic or organizations to collaborate. And, you know, the, the, the objectives can always be different. The objective for one stakeholder can be to crowd in funding, but the objective for other can we can we get deeper impact? Can we actually ensure that we we get you know the deep impact that we want? So you know there are different motivations, but the relevance at this time is very high. Great, thank you very much, uh, Prashi. Uh, and we'll we'll come to Abha soon. And you know, and I'm really keen to learn more about the the sling piece for sure. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, we'd love to hear from Dun. Hi, hi, Dun. Uh, uh, specifically the perspective of, you know, risk capital. You guys have been involved in, I think, so many different impact bonds. Uh, so we are also risk capital as Asha Impact, and we're now examining, evaluating whether uh, we should invest in some of these bonds. So, could, so, so we'd love to hear your perspective 
on how you have uh, gone about this. And a couple of specific questions that you could focus on, you know, which is what is the current investor sentiment uh, amongst investors globally, h and institutions, after all of this erosion in wealth that has happened, right? What appetite is there for deploying additional risk capital? Uh, and, you know, are investors looking at this from their philanthropic buckets or their commercial buckets? How are global investors looking at blended finance in India? And the final issue that comes up is this force majeure risk, right? That which COVID itself is one. That how do you price in these kind of risks and so on? So I'd love to hear from you, Dan, and all that UBS Optimus is doing and overall the perspective of risk capital in this industry. Um, and thanks, Prati, for those um, insights and for sharing those examples. Um, I will get to your questions, Karthik, and I think these are more of the, the technical ones, but maybe what I will do is start off with maybe broader thoughts yeah. on you know, what, what is needed in the education and skilling sector, and particularly in light of, of COVID now, um, how blended finance, social finance can play a role, and then how do we also look at growing the market um, more broadly, more widely. Uh, but maybe- speak a little bit louder, than, sorry, this, it's the oh. audio is a bit more. Is that better now? Yes, slightly better. Uh, so I'll start off by telling you a little bit about the UBS Optimist Foundation, which is uh, basically a client-facing foundation within UBS that is the world's uh, largest private wealth management. Now, the funds that we apply to the Optimist Foundation um, are uh, from UBS, its employees, and uh, UBS's clients, so mainly ultra and high net worth individuals um, that bank with UBS. Um, so this puts us as a foundation in, a, in an interesting and unique position um, and really frames one of our key objectives, which is to bring more and better funding for development programs uh, and particularly to provide uh, catalytic funding to drive innovation and impact. So we target the last mile and bottom of the pyramid users and are very much focused on maximizing impact first, even as uh, investors. Um, so now just a little bit about our social finance work, we look at three key um, areas in social finance. The first being building the ecosystem for outcomes-based financing and blended finance through uh, knowledge exchange, uh, creating platforms and providing grant funding when needed. Second area is testing uh, new instruments and delivery models. And that's really where uh, in the past and, and currently we provide risk investment to a number of outcomes contracts, uh, including for impact bonds um, in India and South Africa as well. And a number of others in pre-launch um, phase. Uh, a social success note, Karthi, we talked earlier about social success note, social success note in Uganda, and also um, look at making direct investments into social enterprises. And then the third area that we look at, so once these instruments are, are tested or we've proven de delivery models, looking at leveraging synergies to take these models to scale, um, such as looking at work where we are pooling uh, risk investment through a UBS social impact fund or designing a primary health outcomes fund uh, targeted in Africa or looking at an education financing facility in Africa as well. So all of these are at scale and then in partnership. Um, so with that context, in terms of who we uh, are as an organization, um, I, I'll start off with maybe some reflections on you know, kind of what's happening in education, what are we seeing through the education uh, impact on the in India um, and other education programs also in India and globally. Uh, uh, hi, Den. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sorry to interrupt. This is Sriram here. Uh, I think a lot of people feel that the volume is a little low. Maybe if that's the best you can, then that's all right. But uh, if you could perhaps come closer. I'll speak louder. <laughs> Thank you. All right, I will try and speak louder. <clears throat> so just coming to then the impact on education and skilling and in light of COVID, what we're seeing is, um, I guess, or what is the need that, that, that we see is certainly in the mid to long term talking about uh, education sector resilience and then how blended finance can play a role there. And, um, but more uh, immediate short-term need being program delivery modifications, looking at what needs to be done 
during social distancing and lockdown, for example, and then what changes in delivery will be required post lockdown uh, really to help children uh, catch up when schools start. Um, and, and in that, what we're seeing is a lot of innovation around remote and distance learning solutions. And we think that this will play an important role, particularly in maintaining learning continuity for children. Um, but we, with the caveat or with the understanding that learning outcomes, particularly for lowest income families, will not be the same uh, as in regular classroom delivery or as, in, as we're seeing in high income countries or, or with high income schools. But remote solutions will, will help with the continuity and also with some social emo emotional and psychological resilience that will help children when they do come back to school. So it's, it's important nonetheless. But what I feel is, is key here is also to look at frugal innovation in that sense. So what are the remote solutions that will effectively reach the children uh, with limited and poor access? And, uh, and so that will be key. Uh, now, given the magnitude of the, uh, the pandemic's impact on systems, on funding, on organizations, and then, of course, at a child level, um, the challenges we are facing in the sector are even more severe than before. And that's where pay for performance can provide a pathway for recovery for the sector. So one, some of the things that we see or the characteristics within these pay for performance mechanisms uh, through examples um, like the Education Dib in India or, or others um, is that flexibility and program deli delivery that's really enabling them uh, uh, to and uh, enabling the in implementers to make the, the program modifications and continue to work towards achieving goals um, on um, uh, with, with flexible funding. And what has also been very encouraging has been the positive response and collective responsibility by funders. And many of these structures actually force funders to come together. And I think by virtue of, of that funder relationship, there has been a binded commitment to, uh, to program goals and, and also commitment to work together to find solutions. Uh, so really encouraging things coming out of the sector. Uh, but more broadly, you know, how do we, uh, how do we use blended finance to kind of catalyze uh, philanthropy in a sort of COVID and post-COVID scenario? Um, you know, what we're seeing right now is a lot of funding being repurposed for emergency relief efforts, um, mm. pressure on governments, philanthropy, uh, to fund locally and take a sort of first things first approach. Uh, and, and, and also a funding tsunami as we usually see with in emergency situations, which all basically means that strong grassroots organizations that are delivering learning outcomes could uh, eventually run out of funding sources. And so the question is, how do we meet short-term funding requirements uh, and yet avoid a hitch to development initiatives that might later come? Uh, and so while currently there are some short-term challenges, I think there is a huge opportunity for, uh, and now more than ever, for a paradigm shift in how philanthropy and then um, public spending can drive development outcomes. So while funding pots are being um, um, used towards emergency um, response currently, in time, funding will start to dry up and funders will become more discerning in how and where they apply their resources. Um, and that is where we will need to see more effective philanthropy. And that is where outcome-based funding can come in because uh, it has the ability to catalyze the system's focus and to drive um, uh, the uh, resu results focus in, in um, philanthropic and public spending and due to two key features. The first being, uh, because of the nature of pay for results, it shifts payment timings. And so funders who are strained now can pay later for results. And secondly, it can bring in different kinds of funders with different risk return profiles and different funding appetites at, at a time like this. Um, so this timing gap could be interesting and can be funded by investors who also might be interested in market opportunities uh, or uh, that are uncorrelated to financial uh, markets. Um, so now the key will really be, I think, scale. And it will become important to think about uh, how do we look at these solutions at scale uh, in order to, to build and grow the market. So, Karthi, coming to also your, your question uh, around 
you know, how do we do that? How do we grow the market? And what is what are sort of things to focus on? One of the um, initiatives that we supported at a global level is, is the Impact Bond Working Group. And I thought I'd share a few insights from, from convenings on that, on this very topic. Um, and uh, so the Impact Bond Working Group is, is co-led by us along with the Swiss CEPO and UK's DFID. And it convenes key bilateral and multilateral donors to basically uh, look at what are the paths to scale for outcomes funding and how do we grow this market. And so the key areas or three key areas that have emerged from that piece of work have been to grow the market, we need to look at knowledge exchange, setting up uh, a knowledge hub, and uh, and what the Impact Bond Working Group, group has, has supported is, is work by Oxford uh, through the Government Outcomes Lab, uh, looking at outcomes acceleration, so really how do you support new impact bonds and uh, better quality impact bonds uh, through grant, um, design grants, technical assistance grants, uh, and thirdly, looking at pooling of funding so both at the outcomes level as well as um, so both at the outcome funding level as well as the uh, risk investment levels so with outcome funding we've seen big announcements like the world bank and diffid uh, with over uh, 300 dollar a million dollars announced um, and on pooling risk investment uh, uh, we've initiated um, within UBS and with, between the, in partnership between the Optimist Foundation and our colleagues within UBS, uh, the setting up of a social impact fund, uh, which will actually make impact first risk investment more appealing for the more mainstream investors. So coming a little bit Karthik to your question in terms of who are the investors who who, who, who actually support programs like this. And through this blended risk investment um, stack, we really believe that, the, uh, you know, so we're looking at a tiered basically capital stack with philanthropic funding coming in to cushion the more senior tranches of investment and, uh, and, um, and, and doing that in, in collaboration with the bank uh, platform. Uh, so, 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 you know, I think overall looking at really knowledge sharing, making sure that NGOs, intermediaries are capacitated to participate in a market like this, and then looking at uh, pooling funding at scale. Uh, I think those are the three key areas that we need to look at going forward. Great. Wonderful. No, thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for that uh, comprehensive overview and perspective. Uh, and so many issues there to pick, to pick up on. And we'll come back to that in the, in the Q&A. Uh, hi, hi, Abhag. Uh, great, great to have you with us. Uh, uh, I, I've given you intro actually at the beginning of the panel, but just 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 to quickly let everyone know, the British Asia Trust is a uh, is a not for profit, and uh, you know uh, working with a lot of major donors uh, who are British Indi Indians uh, and British Asians. Uh, so I guess a question for you, Abha, is you know there's many things that the British Asian Trust could have done. Uh, so maybe going a little bit back to first principles, why develop an impact bonds? What has been your experience of them? Uh, needless to say, you guys are you know involved in the different dibs which have been there in the market, and and what do you see as the role for the dibs in the post-COVID world? Thank you, Karthik, and uh, very good to see my friends uh, on the panel as well. We uh, we were together early morning, I think six o'clock UK time. Uh, they've gotten used to seeing me in my pajamas regularly. So as uh, collaborative funders, the one thing you get to know is the insides of their houses and their minds uh, very very early morning and when not to catch them on the wrong side. So collaborative funding has many advantages. And in, uh, in a COVID situation, I would say the top advantage is you, you really do get to know your, your partners um, and you work together. So thank you for having me. Um, I will answer the first question. I'll do it in three things. Uh, what, why did we decide to do this? And we could be doing a lot of other stuff. Uh, what did we learn? And what are we doing now? Um, and I'll try and answer on all those three things. I'll try and bring a COVID piece on it. Um, so sort of three years ago, we started exploring uh, this space. And I'll be honest, we didn't start by saying we want to do blended finance. Now let's find the book and let's read it and let's start doing it tomorrow. We started by saying that we uh, have always worked in philanthropy. We've always used grant as a tool. But grant works with the premise that here's a great idea. Let's put some money in it and let's see if it works. Is there a different premise we could start with? Could we start with the premise that we know the outcome that we want to have? And can we actually put funding into it? And can we then see where the funding itself can change the way actors behave? So the behavior of all the actors around the table was what I was really excited about. 
Um, and uh, we went to our friends at the Optimist Foundation who had, who had done Educate Girls. And he said, right, what do we do together? And they said, something big. And I said, what does big look like? And they said, nothing under 10 million. And of course, you had to work with the MSDF Foundation at that point. So they were the people who came right after that. And as three partners, we designed and co-designed the education. That's our starting point. What can we do that doesn't fund just a good idea, but funds a result and an impact? And also is so focused mm -hmm. on that that if it did not achieve, we don't put money in. That's that. Now we've had three years in this space, right? We've worked with our partners, we've designed, we've launched, we've fought, we've uh, collaborated, we've implemented, we've had good results, we've questioned our results, we've questioned our targets in some cases, uh, we've questioned our models, we've questioned just about everything as we work together, which is what early adopters do. Uh, and, and the analogy I'll use here for you, Karthik and Aparna, is the one of an uh, iPhone. A person who could use around a block and gets a new iPhone actually is the one who's dealing with the bugs. So we are, as a group of people, the, the bug users. You know, so we've got the bugs, we've learned from the bugs. And we are, so I'll give you some examples of what that means. So in the beginning, uh, the criticism of impact bonds, and I'm sure it's the same now, and I'm waiting for those questions to come. It costs a lot, uh, transaction costs. So some of the real bug fixtures that we're trying to do as a sector Dhan referred to is how do you quicken the pace? How do you get better technical assistance in? So it's faster, quicker, you get the legals done. We're working with the folks like Aparna on how legals can be solved from different kinds of financing coming in. So really making sure that those learnings that we have go into the sector. So that's the first thing that we're really doing. Take the bugs, catch them, make sure that you don't have to wait on your iPhone for a photograph to load. That's one. Second, we believe that the basic premise of an impact bond, right, where you have collaborative funding, you focus on outcomes and not on inputs, um, flexible, all that's brilliant. But I just don't think it's a textbook that you can follow on that. Depending on the context and depending on the social problem you're trying to solve, you've got to vary it. That's our biggest lesson. Again, I'll use an analogy because I'm, uh, it's lunchtime here. Uh, it's like getting a recipe from your mother on WhatsApp, right? She'll give you a recipe that's nothing exact, but it tastes brilliant. Uh, you follow a book, it doesn't taste as good. So I suggest that actually the way you approach an impact bond is akin to that recipe on WhatsApp. You say, right, how do I solve my problem? What do I know from my programmatic work or my grant work? And how do I apply it to this? You don't take a technique and then put it into that because it doesn't work. And there could be many things you solve in the recipe. Who is the risk investor? In a post-COVID world, I would say governments could be risk investors because governments got to take risk. Private sector may be bleeding at this point. You could say service providers might take on some of their own risk and change the way the paradigm works. You might say that the outcome could be played, paid for by somebody very different in this context. So what you do is you take the recipe and you design for what the problem is. You don't start with by saying, this is the recipe I want to apply to this problem. Uh, it won't work. So that's my second sort of big input at lunchtime as I'm waiting for my food to come. Uh, and the third piece is about COVID and leapfrogging. I, don't, I think what COVID's done for people like us who are sort of like champions and pioneers of this piece as, as a group of us is to say, how do you leapfrog some of the problems we were having and getting people to adopt them, especially governments? We find that the one thing that's really, really helped us is to leapfrog and say, right, let's jump. We need flexible funding. You need to pivot your model to distance and, trade and digital models. Find here some flexible funding. The outcome is all agreed up front. And let's see how you're going to do it. And let's determine how risk transfer is going to work. That's just three bits of learning. Uh, on the QEI dip, I didn't hear my partners uh, speak about the results in detail, but so I'll speak a little bit about the why behind the results. The good results are great. Um, and uh, again, an analogy here. Uh, it's like being a parent, right? You get this amazing report card from your, 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 your child and you say, oh, this is incredible. You know, am I an amazing parent or is it because my child is a genius? And the group's sort of there right now. They're going almost, you know, what's going on over here? Or what's what's endemic to our providers or what's the are we the great you know parents in this piece or is the div doing it and i think the answer in all cases as it is with our children it is a combination of things we do have brilliant providers but brilliant providers provided with the right nurturing environment take their results and absolutely kill it and that's what we're starting to see and while we can bottle that up and you know give you a tonic of the how do you do it for other providers? We hope we can do that with a lot of providers in the coming months. We have an outcome readiness program kicking off. We really genuinely would say that it is about the combination of that nature and nurture piece within the div. That focus on performance management where someone's holding your hand. That ability to give somebody the data in the classroom that GMI gives and allows the, teach, the, the providers to use that data flexibly and to understand what they change. Finance not being about a log frame about how many 
trainings you provided, but finance being about what can you do with this money to make your impact happen? Those are the reasons. That's the sort of nurture bit of all of this. And of course, there are these great providers that would never take away credit from what they've been doing. And that's incredible. So the question when you asked me about how do you grow the market? I think for me, there are three actors who need to work together on this. There's government outcomes, social outcomes, the ultimate buyer of any social outcome in any country is a government. They are increasingly turning to us and asking us to come in and say, right, what can we do together with you? How can we really drive outcomes with society and with other collaborators? So we really believe government capability building is a top priority for PA. The second is the lack of data. Uh, out, the minute you start talking outcomes, uh, and if we didn't have MSDF around at the education dip, you know, how do you measure something? They put GMI on the table and said, right, here's a measurement framework you can use. We're looking at skilling now, and we've been on calls just over the last few weeks. The first question is, what data should we be using? What is that measurement? And it doesn't exist. We need to invest. In that. And the third is, of course, our providers, really getting them ready. And that's a combination, again, of good systematic data usage and attitude. I have to be honest, the best data people may not make the best DIB partners because they may not have the attitude to adapt and learn as they do it. I don't know if I've answered all your questions. I have a bunch of more stuff, but I'd rather have a QA and a and get to what people want to hear than bang on about the backbones. No, no, that's very well put, Baba. Thanks for, for you know, tackling that question of um, how, how did we get there. And I, and I wanted to mention tomorrow, Aparna and uh, Sanchi from our team are leading a workshop along with folks like ID Inside, Dalberg, and all specifically on this issue, which mm -hmm. is uh, how do you make an NGO dibbable? Uh, and the issue of data, performance management, and capacity, that really has to be the focus. Uh, and today we were trying to focus more on, you know, the, the fundraising uh, funders' perspectives and the intermediaries' perspectives. So we have a lot of questions. Uh, I think if I can also add that at uh, 6 p.m. tomorrow, we are also co-hosting another session where we will go into the details and results of a lot of education pilots that I spoke about. So some of the folks who are specifically interested in blended finance for education can also tune into that session. Um, Prachi, I know you have to leave. So if you have maybe two minutes, um, I think there's a question that maybe you could answer before you leave. Um, that's how do you really ensure the long-term um, sustainability, right? So how does the program really outlive the intervention? Or how does the outcomes outlive the intervention? Uh, because in the three years or four years of the day, everyone's kind of focusing with performance management, et cetera, to make sure that the outcomes are achieved. What happens after that? Yeah, so that's a great question. And I would say it's an unanswered question. It's a, it's a topic that we deliberate upon with all our partners and not just in the context of uh, Deb Aparna, I would say, you know, we, we debate on that question in the context of all the work that we do, right? That hearing comes in the funder with the funding, with a, you know, high powered service provider, you get, you, you know, you get the magic, you get the impact, but you know, how does that, you know, impact sustains beyond uh, beyond them. So one, I would say that, you know, I wouldn't worry that as my top question, given where we are starting and how low our starting point is, it's not my top worry. Uh, you know, if we can get impact and we can get impact at scale, you know, that in itself is an achievement to celebrate uh, for a few years to come and to say, okay, how do I actually, you know, move on from here and hop on to another setting. So, so that is one. The second is, I think it will, you know, most of the education interventions that we are working in, uh, we are working with the government. And therein, I would say the critical thing for the outcomes to sustain is that some fundamental shift comes about in the government education systems, right? We should, uh, we should be moving away from the system of service providers or NGOs coming and fixing what is broken within a, a larger system. And we at Michael and Susan Dell Foundation have a large volume of work, which is just fixing our basic education systems as well. The third, which I think is a much more near term, uh, short term objective that most of us has uh, as uh, you know, participants in this conversation have, that how can we actually structure more and more of social impact bonds? Because that seems to me the next step where you know, public provisioning of money, which is already happening, can be made more effective and efficient. And that hopefully, you know, will sustain the uh, outcomes beyond a set of uh, funders who really bring in a very small amount of capital when we look at the, uh, the larger, you know, problem that we are trying to solve. So I think that's the near term solution that could happen. And uh, I'm also very positive that it will happen based on some of the conversations that we are having. Good. Thank you for answering that. Yeah.
Thanks, Aparna. Thanks, Karthik. I'm sorry I have to pop out uh, earlier, but I will connect with you to take up some of the questions offline. Thank sure. you very much, Rachel. So folks, we've got, I think, over 30 questions. Uh, so I'm not sure if we can get through all of them, but we have about 15 minutes. So Aparna, uh, how should we do this? Should we maybe club them by speaker or by topic? I'm trying to club them by topic, but uh, perhaps um, Abha, we can get you started. There's a question about uh, you know evaluation costs. This is always sort of the elephant in the room. Uh, so maybe if you can you know provide some perspective on that. Um, you know, obviously people are concerned that evaluation costs are high. How do those get addressed? Um, you know, going forward, how do we keep those at a minimum? Yeah, and let me just add to that. And this is a question, I guess, uh, for both Abha and, and Dan, right? Which is the, the, the reducing the timeline and reducing the cost, right? That there have been X number of dibs. There's so much interest on this call and in the industry to do more. And of course, there's larger fundamental issues about fundraising, pricing, and so forth. But if we just focus on this issue, which many people are skeptical about, and they say, look, guys, the cost to set up a dib is so high and the time takes so long, where are we on that? Is that going to dramatically come down or is it still going to be cumbersome to launch more dibs? I can, I can have a first go and I'm sure Dhan will add, uh, add some excellent points as well. Uh, on timeline, it's um, as an organization, we're personally committed to reducing timelines on this. And the way we see it and from our learning is to do several bits of the work together. There are three or four streams of work that are required for a dip to be set up. The fundraising, design, and the legals are the three main streams that we do collect. We do them parallelly as against subsequent, you know, sequence wise as we used to do them previously. So one of our big learnings is to do that together, reduce the timeline on some of the setup. So I genuinely believe with scale and time and learning that's there in the market, the timelines are going down. I mean, we see them most obviously. And if anything, COVID is actually enabling our timelines to reduce. We recently, uh, we, we, on our transaction that we're on currently, we have a two month timeline and our donors are saying, can you do it faster? And I thought, gosh, there was a time when dibs were taking six months uh, or to a year. So even from the times when we started the education dip to now, uh, it's a very different timeline. So I don't think timelines need to stretch if the transaction is for meeting the right problem and for the right solution. I think the problem with some dibs is it's applied to the wrong issues. And I think that it, therein lies the problem. A dip doesn't apply for every single problem. That's a one. On evaluation costs, it's a factor of transaction. So if it's a $10 million dip and the evaluation cost is you know, 5%, 3% or 2% of it, I think that's perfectly reasonable. It's when you have an evaluation cost on a very small transaction, that's when the economics don't work. The early dibs were R&D dibs and they needed that. But by the time you come to our dib, we don't think the evaluation costs are high at all and neither does anybody else. So I think it's a factor of, of size and we have a sort of golden rule that we don't do small dibs and we actually work at scale and, and Dan and others are actually working at even bigger scale than that. So the way the market is going, evaluation doesn't have to cost a lot if you're working with several part partners at scale and using a structure that can be applied to several partners. So both those impediments actually as a market, they're being, they're being addressed and actually executed currently uh, as well. Dhan, you want to add anything to that? I guess just a couple of quick points, completely agree with Abha, and it is really, it's about a scale question. So as you do move to these pooled funds, um, you will actually leverage wider architecture on contracting, evaluation, verification um, for a wider, for, for a larger number of uh, separate transactions. So costs will go down per transaction. Um, also developing local capability. So as we invest in, uh, you know, building capacities, uh, uh, helping, smaller organizations to come up and, and, and play the role in, in assessment, in verification. Uh, and, and I think moving from assessment, which was you know, really required, uh, a rigorous assessment required to develop evidence base with early transactions uh, to verification processes, which are less, uh, are low cost. And then using innovation and technology to explore how we can set down Further. So for example, uh, we are piloting um, the application of blockchain to see how can the overall trans contracting cost as well as verification cost be taken down. In I know I've heard more questions, but but um, one more uh, that I saw, which was things relating to to COVID, right? Uh, specifically. 
this force majeure risk, right? And the NGOs who are out there on the ground delivering X work, now because of COVID is lockdown, they can't do it anymore. So, so I guess two questions. For the existing dibs, were there, have, have those dibs been impacted and uh, people's operations uh, in, impacted and who, who, takes on, who pays for that risk? That's, that's really the question. And can these be built into contracts? So how do we deal with force majeure risks like COVID? I think I'll say, and I'm sorry you uh, actually asked that, uh, asked me that question earlier, and I and I missed addressing it. Uh, so I think in terms of force majeure, this is definitely something that in most contracts is already looked at. So there usually is a force majeure clause, uh, and uh, at the time of design of a contract, uh, you are usually pricing um, for factors excluding force measure scenarios. So your pricing estimations do not factor this in, but your clauses would typically look, look like, um, you know, parties need to, uh, need to uh, engage in discussion and, and come to an agreement in the case of um, uh, scenarios like flood or, or COVID, et cetera. So I think in, you know, that is how it is currently structured in most contracts. And I think that is the right approach because it is very hard to forecast or to, to price risk into that. And so it becomes then a matter of discussion, negotiation, and uh, determining, you know, what amount of risk uh, investors, funders, et cetera, are, are willing to bear and, and coming to an agreement on that at the time. I'll add a couple of things, Karthik, uh, on this. Um, in the, we sit within some of the learning groups on this at the government outcomes level. Uh, overall, people aren't applying force majeure clauses uh, globally. Uh, given the severity of COVID, I think the general, fee, the general recourse has been to discussion and collaborative approaches on it, including on our own education dip. Nobody has turned to saying, either the investors haven't turned the tap off or neither have the outcome funders. We understand this to be a risk as none ever before. And therefore the idea of force majeure being applied I can see for a flood or for something which is a minimal small issue uh, to a certain provider within the contract, but not at the scale that the world is facing currently. So that's the practicality of it. Two is the, what happens if you don't apply force measure? Let's look at the reality of it. And there's a spectrum of solutions we are looking at. If the outcomes that you work on still matter, children still need to learn. And, we, you know, and in the case of our dip, there's no question. Children have to continue to learn. If the focus on outcomes has to continue, the, the group has to agree what degree, what has to change? Do we, for example, reduce the targets that the children have to meet? Or do we change the cost ratios around some of that? Alternatively, do we temporarily move to a pay for service model and then switch back to a pay for outcomes model? There is a whole continuum of decision making which we've agreed first principles on as a group. And most impact bonds are doing that. The excellent thing about a dip is you don't have to go back and renegotiate a contract with a service provider as to what they're doing in the classroom. Tomorrow they can move from training in a certain way and, and move to a completely different model. All the instrument has to do is at the instrument level, agree those principles, change the few parameters that are required in the case of, of crisis and move on. And I think that's actually one of the big strengths of this instrument. If we can make that evidence come out in public domain after this is to pass. The, um, so therefore the, the use has, there hasn't been a force majeure kind of conversation with most impact bonds is, is the answer. But there are many interesting solutions that lie between that and the reality that was before. And let's end with a difficult, perhaps, question, but, a, but an important one, which is the challenges that, okay. that this instrument or this industry faces. Important to discuss, right? We've talked a lot about the potential, and that, that was the point of this discussion and, and, and the perspectives of the funders. And I think it's been a fairly balanced discussion. But maybe it'll be useful, right? Since we have a lot of questions have come up, uh, which we've not been able to cover specific questions, critical questions, and, 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 you know, for example, if you're pricing impact, how do you ensure salaries aren't lowered and all kinds of issues, uh, which I'm sorry uh, to the folks on the session, we weren't able to cover all of these questions, but we will definitely uh, continue the dialogue. But perhaps we can end by saying, talking about what do both of you feel are the two or three biggest challenges in this space that all of us collectively as an industry should be working on? You know, what, what worries you? about uh, the next six to nine months. And that can be related to COVID also, but, 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 but broadly, you know, what could go wrong as we try to mobilize and then launch additional dibs in India specifically? Tan, do you want to go first? Or? Oh yeah, happy to, uh, to go first. 
I think, uh, Karthik, there are challenges and there are opportunities, but I think uh, mainly, if you ask me what, what concerns me most, is uh, you know the, the challenge of how do you um, enable wider participation um, in transactions like this to really the small mid-sized organizations to also be able to benefit from this and that's where a lot of capacity building um, um, effort needs to be um, focused so really that the pipeline challenges of um, um, that, that, that come in uh, I think that's the, the biggest and then I would say secondly and this has been a challenge as well as I think a great and positive experience has been the multi-stakeholder um, partnership. Mm. Uh, but it is, it, it, you know, they do uh, require uh, convening um, uh, many um, or bringing together many different stakeholders, reaching alignment and agreement on what are the right outcomes, what are the right benchmarks. Um, and so um, it can be challenging if not navigated correctly uh, and we have we've you know we, we've heard from many who are stuck in design phase that that's kind of where um you know where things don't move sometimes uh but it's also like i said earlier a great opportunity for actually funders to be coming together on something so um i would say those are the two, two you, Abha, you don't see funding as a challenge right it, no, as, not as, us. yes are <laughs> Uh, the potential of corporates to put more money into this out because people have said in the past outcome funding is not always available risk capital presumably you can unlock mm -hmm. because people get some return for it so you don't see that as a challenge or any other challenges that you want to add to that so yes i'll add a couple of challenges one is uh, and first i agree with dhan i just want to say that um, i always say that i always agree with my investors and then we have the fights uh, later don't we dhan um so so the the first thing i'd say is uh, my biggest challenge is the efficient use of a tool which has a legacy of being slow, being thought of as being slow and complicated mm -hmm. in a time where, where, where agility is the answer. How do we make the tool agile in the context we're in? I am absolutely determined to be part of that answer and show that agility is possible with the tool in the sector. Uh, if, we do, if we don't use this opportunity to do that, as some of the practitioners, we'll be doing the sector a disservice. Let's kill the transaction question, time question. Let's kill the cost question during COVID. Let's move quickly. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. And that is a challenge for me. I want to kill that challenge. The second challenge is why use an impact bond when grant can do getting recovery, you know, grant can do the work better. It's a challenge I ask myself on every single transaction. Can I use grant on this or not? And only when I can answer that challenge for myself, do I use an impact bond? Because if we can't use, if we, grant is king in my, in my world, in the philanthropic world, and when grant stops being king is when an impact bond comes in uh, and trumps it. And that's the, that's the answer, that challenge doesn't go away for us. Do not use an impact bond when it's not required. And that's when I think that's when transactions fail as well, because donors don't buy into things that they know can be done through straightforward grants. They're not stupid. To go and buy a convoluted thing. The convoluted thing should be there for an exam, for a real reason that you want an outcome to happen that is not happening otherwise. That's the second challenge. And the final one is one of government. I think really governments need to come on board on this. If they start buying outcomes and they're able to change the regulatory environment in a way they understand how they can procure outcomes, they're used to procuring inputs, we can really have transformative change. And that is really the big cheese in this, uh, in this discussion. As I'm speaking, it's getting dark in London, so suddenly my room's gone all dark. Sorry, I just know, I've just just noticed. It's a thunderstorm here in Delhi. I don't know if you it's can. It's thunderstorm in Delhi. London's always like this. Lucky me. Um, so, uh, so that's from my side. I, I can go on, but the most important thing, the things I've told you, and, and I've had, and then it's actually got to No, no. Thank, uh, thank you to both of you, uh, and uh, uh, to Prachi as well, who, who's, who's uh, no longer on the call. And it's exactly 6 p.m. So as uh, promised, we sh we'll sign off exactly at 6 uh, uh, to stay on time. And I hope you guys will join the rest of the sessions. And I think there's a plenary session with uh, Mr. Kailash Satyarthi at 7. So thank you all very much. Uh, this was a panel discussion, uh, discussion with leading funders and intermediaries who have really pioneered the impact bond market in India and globally. So thank you to all of you for sharing your insights on the existing models uh, focused on education and spilling, uh, skilling uh, and what structures are most relevant for a post-COVID world. How do not profits need to scale these models and perspectives and how additional risk capital and outcome funding can be mobilized. Uh, and thank you, Shriram, uh, who is the host of our panel and uh, uh, to everyone at Asha Impact team for organizing this. So thank you. Thank very you, much. Thank you, Abba. Thank you then for coming at really short notice and helping us all with this. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you, guys. Thank you all.
Have a great Thank evening. You. you too. Bye-bye. Akanksha. Yes, Aparna. Can we firstly stop recording? And then... oh.